See what we can do with one eye. <laughs> My brother Mark Hunter has been preaching with one eye for probably 20 years. Most people don't know that. Mark's only had one eye since an accident. A battery blew up in his face. A big commercial battery. One of those that goes in big trucks or dozers. And the uh, battery cap hit him right square in the eye. Hit him right dead in the pupil. And put that eye out. And he's been driving and preaching with one eye for a long time. So if he can do it, I can do it. All right. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. This is a powerful chapter, man. There's a lot went on in this chapter. Jesus sends out the 12 disciples. Of course, he was started out in his hometown and Gave him the message that a prophet's not without honor except in his own country. Then we hear about the death of John the Baptist in this chapter. Then we have the feeding of the 5,000. And now we're going to look at a little, a little ship on the lake. Verse 45 of Mark chapter 6. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. They were really working hard. In rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. Did you ever notice that? He would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle, they just left the mountainside where probably a minimum of 10,000 people were fed with five loaves and two fishes. But it said they were in a total amazement about this miracle. For they had considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray, Lord, for wisdom, inspiration, anointing of God to speak forth thy word tonight. We just want to be the mouthpiece. Lord, you give us the word that you have for these people tonight, for us people tonight. Lord, I am, I am as much in need as anyone here tonight to hear from heaven, to hear the voice of God, to have you speak, Lord, some word of encouragement, some word of promise, some word of help and grace that will minister to our hearts tonight. Father, we thank you for it. We ask you to help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's another story in the Bible about Jesus being on the little boat, and they were crossing this same lake, the Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's got six names in the Bible, so you got to figure out what all those are referring to the same place. It's only 11 miles long this way, north and south, and about six miles at the widest place east and west. A pretty good size, 11 miles by six miles. That's a pretty good body of water, but not, uh, not tremendous to cross six miles. But the disciples, you know, the, there's a word there that caught my attention early on in my Bible study. He constrained them. 
It didn't say he told him to get in the ship as he would normally do. You guys get in the ship, go to the other side, I'll meet you later. The Bible says he constrained him. In other words, for some reason, they were hesitant. He was putting pressure on them to get into the ship. Now, we believe that God is all-knowing, correct? Amen. He knew the storm was coming. Amen. He knew they would have trouble rowing. Amen. And he sent them out anyway. Uh-huh, uh-huh, he did. That the trial of your faith may be more precious than gold that perishes. God allows us to be tested, does he not? He allows us to be tested. They were in the fourth watch of the night. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. The last place I would want to be at 3 a.m. is in the middle of a body of water that's heaving up and down. It's a shallow lake. It's like Lake Erie. It's a shallow lake, and when there's a, not much wind at all to whip it up, and you can get five, six-foot waves in a hurry on some of these shallow lakes. But the disciples were out there between 3 and 6 a.m. rowing their, their selves, you know, everything they had in them. And these were seasoned fishermen. They were used to doing that. These were not people who had been couch potatoes. These were fellows that were in good shape. They were probably brawny men, and they probably could, could handle the boat under normal circumstances, but they were having trouble getting that six miles covered because the wind was against them. Jesus knew all these circumstances. And yet he sent them into the boat. And I believe he sent them into the boat for another test and trial of their faith. To teach them to rely on him. Now I'm going to go back just a little bit. We're going to combine two boat stories. The other one, he's on the Sea of Galilee in a little boat. And he's tired from the day's activities so he finds a cushion somewhere in the bow or stern or somewhere in the middle. I don't know what part of the boat he was in. But he found a pillow and he made himself comfortable and he just went to sleep. Well, again, partway through their journey, a wind comes down out of the north probably, off of the mountains, whips up that little lake and the men are, are getting scared. The boat is filling up with water and Jesus is fast asleep. He said, how could he sleep under those conditions? I don't know. But he was asleep. The Bible says he was asleep. To the point that it got such a crisis that the men on board the boat, his disciples, awoke him and asked him, don't you care? I'm putting it in our vernacular. Don't you care that we perish? Perish? Where's your faith? <laughs> Where is your faith? And then, after he rebuked the disciples, he rebuked the wind and the waves. Friend, I believe that God allows things to come into our life to test us. You know, <clears throat> a test is for several different reasons. Some of it is to show what you've learned and how well you're progressing in the academic program. The test is also to prove what you have failed to learn. That's the red marks on there. That's the X marks with red ink. You know, that's what you fail to get in the curriculum. And you know, tests are very important for the teacher's sake, but they're very important for the pupil's sake if they'll take an interest in their own education because you realize I've got some weaknesses here. I need to work on them. And the same thing is true spiritually as we go through tests, as we go through trials, as we go through battles, and we find ourselves getting some red marks. And Jesus has to say, where is your faith? At another point, he asks him, oh, ye of little faith. Why can't we believe him? You know, we had just seen a miracle here. This group had just witnessed a tremendous miracle. I mean, if I had been at that smorgasbord, I would still be amazed. I'm amazed and I wasn't even there. Five loaves and two little fish. A boy's lunch. And Jesus fed at least 10,000 people, probably more. There were 5,000 men, 
plus women and children, it says. And Jesus fed them all with a, a boy's lunch. And as the disciples took that little meager beginnings and began to pass them out, and I believe they were put in, a, in an orderly fashion. They weren't just sitting any which way. They were, they were put in rows and in, and in groups of 50 and in groups of 100. They were laid out in an organized way so they could see Jesus and so they could see what was happening with the disciples. And as, the, as Peter and John and James would pull out a fish and hand it out, two more jumped in that basket. You know, I mean, can you imagine how, what that miracle looked like? They saw God perform the supernatural, do the miraculous. And that loaf of bread, that little bitty bun. We were in Israel and Bob Neuheiser was with us and bless Bob's heart. He, he, he was pretty picky about his eating. But he thanked the Lord for the bread. Every morning there was raw fish on the salad bar, breakfast bar. Raw fish. Some of you may like sushi. I don't know, but... I have enough trouble eating a cooked fish, but raw fish don't get it. So it was boiled eggs, I recognize those, and the little homemade buns. That made a good breakfast. But here we have these little homemade rolls, would be equivalent probably to our rolls, that we have this little lad's lunch, and as they handed one to this guy, then they looked back in the basket, and there was two more. And he handed it out, and there was two more. And he kept passing out and the basket kept getting fuller and fuller. That's my imagination. But some way God put a miracle in place. They saw a miracle. Have you seen a miracle? All right, there's one. Right there's one, right there's one, right there's one. We're all miracles, friend. If by God's grace we've been saved and the blood has been applied and our names are written in heaven, we're a miracle. Amen? We're all miracles. Now some have seen other kinds of miracles. I've seen some miracles. I've had some miracles happen in my life. I thank God for them. I don't want to forget them because the next storm coming, I'm going to need to fall back on what I saw. I need to have that permanently stamped on my mind so that when the storm comes and I begin to be tempted to be fearful and to think we're not going to make it through, I like what Roger Jarrett said when he come down toward the end. He said, if God heals me, I'll be good. If he takes me to heaven, I'll be good. He said, I'll win either way. You know, we will win either way as Christians. Mary Brown will win either way. Either God will heal her and raise her up with the cancers or God will give her a new body and she go up there and shout over the streets of glory with Judy Williams. Amen. Her co-worker for many, many years. Friends, we have within us this eternal life that's begun down below. But we need to expect, I guess, the test. I believe Jesus put them in the boat. There was two reasons why they might have not wanted to go. Right after the death of John the Baptist, this was the year of popularity of Jesus Christ. They were wanting to make him a king. The crowds, and especially this crowd, Man hunger and poverty will be removed from Israel if Jesus becomes our king. No one will go hungry. Look at this. He can spread a table for 10,000 in the desert, in the wilderness. What a king. Let's make him king. That was one, that's one theory of why Jesus was, because the disciples kind of had that same notion in their minds. You know, they wanted him to be a civil leader. They wanted him to set up an earthly kingdom. He didn't come for that. So he had to quiet the crowd and dismiss them without being taken and put on their shoulders and carried into Jerusalem and said, we've got our new king. You know, they, he didn't want that to happen. That wasn't his plan. So he sent the disciples away so they wouldn't get charged up with that same political fervor. The other idea, which is my idea, is I believe... He knew they were still lacking something in their faith. And he wanted to show them another miracle. He wanted to show them another miracle. So if the disciples were about halfway across, they'd gone approximately three miles if they were at the widest place. They'd toiled all night, gone only about halfway, and Jesus caught up with them walking. 
They're walking. There's a boardwalk across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, no, there's no boardwalk across the Sea of Galilee. He was walking on the water, friends. Now, in the middle at 3 a.m. in the morning, just a few stars and a little bit of moonlight out on the waters, and they're turbulent. They're casting shadows because the waves are high and foam and all that goes with the... But they see somebody. They think. They see something. I don't know what it is. Can't be a man because men don't walk on water. And they were scared. And then Jesus was going to pass them by. You mean he would leave us in our moment of despair and in our moment of fear and in the storm when there's no help in sight? And No. No, he wouldn't. But he wants you to call. He wants you to call. He wants you to say, hey, Lord, I need you. He's teaching us a lesson. He's teaching them a lesson. We need in the storm to call on the Lord. He's not very far. He's not very far from any of us. Even in the darkest hour of our life, Jesus is not very far from any of us. And we think about him being in the boat and asleep and seemingly unconcerned, seemingly even unaware of what danger they were in. But immediately he was able to take charge of that situation. Immediately he was able to calm the sea. And again in this situation, to calm the sea. What a mighty God we serve. It's this same Jesus that lives in our heart. Do you know that? It is the same Jesus that lives in us. And he says in his word, he is unchangeable. He is immutable, which means unchangeable. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He knows what to do. He's all-knowing. He can meet our needs, and he wants to. But he will allow us to be tested. He will allow us to go through some trials. He put his favorite son Abraham through a trial. Tremendous trial. He's put Job through a tremendous trial. He's put numerous. Joseph went through a new, uh, several heavy trials to get to where God needed him to be. But in every one of those trials, there is a lesson to be learned. There is something to be gained. There is something to be gleaned that will fortify us for the next situation. It's very important, church, that we allow the Lord to test us. That we realize that the storms of life are the trying of our faith. And I like what Peter said. The trial of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes. It is precious. Because faith is what's going to get us through. Faith is what's going to win the battle. Faith is what overcomes the world. Faith is what defeats the devil. Faith is what's going to carry you all the way from here to glory. And so your faith will be tried. It will be tested. The enemy will try you too. He will tempt you. God will not tempt you, but God will test you. Temptation is an allurement to do evil. God will never do that. But he will test you. He will prove you and let you prove yourself. Remember Brother George Schaefer saying the Lord had to kick every prop out from under him. Early in his Christian experience, he said the Lord kicked every prop out from under me. He said, I didn't have one stick to stand on. I didn't have a thing. He said the Lord had to take me down to absolute zero until he could start back and build me the way he wanted me to be. You know, and Brother Schaefer was a, a mighty man of God, a very unique individual, a man that God mightily used in his work. But sometimes we have to be tested and tried. But thank God the Lord is never very far. He saw them. I mean, he had his eye on them, didn't he? Even from the mountain where he was praying, he's got that keen vision. <laughs> he's got that keen vision. He can see in the dark. The darkness and the light are the same to God. So Jesus was looking out through the dark stormy night and he saw his disciples out there rowing 
And I can almost imagine him saying, well, I guess it's time. They've rode long enough. I'm going to have to get over there. And he might have jumped the first mile and a half. I don't know. He could have. I mean, he could have took a giant step the first mile and a half and, and cut the distance in half and then took another giant step and he was only 100 yards from him and then he started walking normally because another 100 yards had been by him, wouldn't he? Or half a mile or whatever. But Jesus is not very far and he's never unconscious of what's going on in our lives. We can take great comfort in that. God knows, God cares, and God will help us. When we call, when we cry out, when we get to the point of desperation and said, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I've rowed until I can't row anymore. The storm is bigger than I am, Lord. Come and help me. You believe you'll do it? I believe you'll do it. I believe you'll do it. And I believe we need to get that in our mind firmly fixed because the storms come and it comes to good people, godly people, People that are not really where they need to be sometimes get, get involved in a storm. It comes to all. It rains on the just and on the unjust, my Bible says. But we need church to realize that God, if we want to serve him and if we're going his way, we need to realize that this could be just a way of improving us and in strengthening us and increasing our faith over and over. God wants to do that because faith is so vital. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But it said here that their heart was hardened. I wonder why that happened or how that happened, don't you? I mean, they just witnessed a tremendous miracle. They just listened to the Lord teach there on the hillside for hours and hours. They just listened probably to two or three camp meeting sermons that afternoon. <laughs> Jesus had taught the people and so it was an all-day thing. The little boy packed a lunch. You don't have one of those long-winded preachers that you have to pack a lunch. But, uh, you know, some of them are. Stay yet today, some of them are. But yet, they just left that atmosphere. What do you reckon hardened their hearts that quickly? I could only guess, if you'll allow me to guess, but when the storm got so bad and the rowing got so hard, don't you imagine a little doubt, a little tinge of unbelief? Where's the Lord? And can't you hear the devil jumping up on Peter's shoulder? Where's he at now, big boy? Where's your helper at now, big boy? You chief apostle, you number one apostle Peter, where is he now? The devil's ruthless that way. And he'll jump on your shoulder right in the midst of the storm and say, he doesn't care about you. Could you imagine it might have been just a tinge of doubt? Just a little bit of unbelief until it began to harden their hearts and they began to almost get in despair. And then when they saw the apparition, which was really Jesus, they thought was a, a ghost or spirit, and they were really terrified then. But then the Lord said, it's I. It's I, be not afraid. It's I. He's not very far. He's not out of earshot. You're never out of his sight. I want to encourage you tonight, God will help us through the storms. Amen. God will help us through the storms. What storms are coming, preacher? I wished I knew. <laughs> I wished I could tell you how to prepare for what's coming. I wish I knew, but friends, something's coming. But, but, the same one that constrains us to stay in the boat is going to show up right when we need it. Amen? Take faith tonight. Take hold of that. God will not abandon his children. He will not suffer our foot to be moved, the psalmist said. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. There's scripture after scripture that tells us of the faithfulness of God. Hide those in your heart. 
And then when the storm comes, recite them, quote them. My wife and I were looking at the, I've got part of the last chapter of Romans memorized, but I'm going to go back up a little farther and try to get a little more of it. Neither famine, nor persecution, nor peril, or sword. You know, that, that passage of Scripture, it talks about we're more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Perils, persecution, famine. Do you ever worry about being hungry? I don't think I've ever worried about being hungry a day in my life. I've always had something to eat if I wanted it. Famine. Hunger. We can't really sympathize with these poor refugee people. We can't really sympathize with these Haitians and Africans that live in such poverty. They have so little to eat till their little bellies are swelled out and their little hair is turning red from malnutrition. We can't sympathize with that. We've never gone hungry probably a day in our life except we were fasting. It was our choice. But God, God said we are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, that's the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that a good promise? Amen. That's at the very end of Romans chapter 8. Oh, that God would help us to hide something in our heart, friends. Now people go through storms right now. People are going through storms right now. But I want you to know, it's the same Jesus. If we love him and are serving him with all of our heart, he has us in his eyesight. And his ear is open to our cry. Amen. Well, I hope the Lord will encourage you a little. And again, I can encourage you to store up those testimonies of the times he's helped you, the times he delivered you when it looked like all was lost, the, the times that, you know, like laying in that hospital down in Spartanburg, 16 liters of oxygen on my nose. I didn't know if I was going to come out or not. Most of the days I didn't care. I was sick. But I want you to know, I want to remember that God brought me out. Amen. Amen. All those times where the Lord works in your behalf, recite them, renew those, visit those again. Lord, I thank you. Amen. The doctors told me when I was about 21 years of age, I hurt my back, lower back. I crushed two vertebrae, ruptured two or three discs, and the doctor says, you'll never be able to work again. I haven't quit working since Jesus healed me of that. It was a slow process of healing. It was a, a, a measure of grace. He didn't just completely take the pain away. He didn't just completely take the muscle tightness away. He gave me grace and gave me help and gave me relief when I needed it. God has helped me to go now for 40 some years after that. I don't know how many more I got, but I tell you what, I'm thanking the Lord for what he did for me back there. Time and time again. We need to res that's why our testimony is so important. It might encourage someone else too when they're in the storm. That's why we ought to praise God when he does something for us. Give him praise because that's another mile post that you can mark as a marker and you can say, Lord, I remember when you met this need and you're able to do it again. It'll help your faith. It'll bolster your faith. So mark it down. Put some mile markers along the way with those testimonies as God would help you. Praise the Lord tonight. Every heart clear. Anyone want to put down a mile marker before we go? All right. Shall we stand? Appreciate those that have been on the phone tonight. Thank you for calling in. The Lord bless you. Keep us in prayer this week. God bless.